Chapter Two, Part E of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter Two, Part E. An illiterate patchwork of lifeless and uninteresting scribbling appeared under my byline day after day in the intelligencer. Not a word, not a thought of my own was left. I was not restrained from protest by the absurd threats of lefacity, but prudence dictated not throwing away dirty water before I got clean, and the money from the paper, while negligible of course, yet provided my most pressing needs. As I was being paid for my name while my talents went to waste, I was free to go anywhere I pleased, but I had little desire to leave the vicinity of the grass. It exerted upon me, more understandably, the same fascination as on the merely curious. But I was not permitted unmolested access to the phenomenon with which I was so closely concerned. An officious young guardsman warned me away brusquely, and I was not allowed to come near until I swallowed my pride and claimed connection with the intelligencer. Even then, it was necessary for me to explain myself to several nervous soldiers on pain of being ordered from the spot. I was struck, as I had not been before, by the dynamic quality of the grass, never the same for successive instants constant movement and struggle as the expanding parts fought for room among themselves pushing upward and outward seemed to indicate perceptible sentience permeating the whole body preparing brooding it was disturbed searching alert its external aspect reflected the change the proportions of height to breadth had altered since the explosion the peak had disappeared, flattening out into an irregular plateau. Its progress across the ground, however, had been vastly accelerated. It had crossed the streets on all sides of the block, and was spreading with great rapidity over the whole district. For the moment, no new effort was apparently being made to halt its progress, the activities of the militia being confined to patrolling the area and shooing decent citizens away. I wondered if a new strategy contemplated allowing the thing to exhaust itself. Since it looked more vigorous with each passing hour, I saw myself on the payroll of the intelligencer for a long time to come. Captain Eltwis walked by, and I asked him if this were so. Don't worry, he reassured me. We're hep now with the actual unbeatable McCoy. Park the body and watch what happens to old Mr. Grass. I had every intention of staying, and I thought it advisable to remain close to the captain in order, if his boast were well founded, to be in on the kill. He was in excellent spirits, and although I did not think it tactful to refer to it, it was evident his little difference with the colonel about the unreceived orders had not affected him. We chatted amiably. I mentioned what Miss Frances had said about the weed springing up in new places from each of the shreds dispersed by the explosion, but he merely shrugged and laughed. I know these long-bearded scientific nuts. They can find calamity around the corner quicker than a drunk can find a bar. The discoverer of the metamorphizer is a woman, so her long beard is doubtful, I told him, just a little irritated by his cocksureness. He laughed with as much ease at himself as at anything else. A woman scientist, eh? Funny things women'll do when they can't get a man. But long-bearded or flat-chested, it's all the same. Gruesome, that's what they are. Gruesome. Forget it. After we get this cleaned up, we'll take care of any others that start. But personally, I don't think there'll be any. Sounds like a lot of theory to me. I looked contemptuously at him, for he had that unimaginative approach which disdains science, and so holds civilization back on its upward path. If the world's future rested with people like this, I thought, we should never have had dynamite, or germ theories, or airplanes capable of destroying whole cities at a blow. But Captain Eltwis was a servant to the science he looked down on. The answer he had bragged about now appeared, and it was a scientific contribution if ever there was one. A division of tanks, 
twenty or thirty of them, with what appeared to be sled runners invertedly attached to their fronts, rolled into sight. Wire cutters, he explained with pride. Same equipment used for barbed wire on the Normandy beachhead. Go through anything like cheese. The tanks drew up in a semicircle, and the drivers came out of their vehicles for last-minute preparations. A final check was made of gas, oil, and the positions of the wire cutters. Maps, showing the location of each house now covered by the grass, were studied, and compass points checked against them. I admired the thoroughness and efficiency of the arrangements. So did the captain. The idea is simple. These tanks are shock troops. They'll cut their way into the middle of the stuff. This will give us entranceways and a central operating point, besides hitting the grass where its strength is greatest. From there, he paused impressively, from there we'll throw everything in the book at it and a few that aren't. All the stuff they used before we came, only we'll use it efficiently, and everything else, even hush-hush stuff. We just got the release from Washington. The minute one of these stem shows, we'll stamp it out. We'll fight it, and fight it until we beat it, and we won't leave a bit of it, no sir, not one bit of it alive. He looked at me triumphantly. Behind his triumph was a hint of the vast resources and the slow-moving but unassailable force his uniform represented. It sounded as though he had been correct in his boast, and something drastic indeed would happen to Mr. Grass. The tanks were ready to go at last, and the drivers climbed back into them and disappeared, leaving the steel monsters looking as though they'd swallowed the men. Like bubbles of air in a narrow glass tube, they began to jerk backward and forward, until at some signal, I presume given by radio, they jumped ahead, their exhausts bellowing defiance of the grass mauled and torn by their treads. They went onward with careless scorn, leaving behind a bruised and trampled pathway. The captain followed in the track and I after him, though I must admit it was not without some trepidation I put my feet upon the battered and now lifeless mass packed into a hard roadbed, for I recalled clearly how the grass had wrenched the ladder from the firemen and how it had impishly attacked the broadcaster's equipment. The tanks moved ahead steadily until the slope of the mound began to rise sharply, and the runners of grass, instead of flattening obediently behind, curled and twisted grotesquely as the tracks passed over them, lightly slapping at the impervious steel sides. Small bunches, mutilated and crushed, sprang back into erectness. Larger ones flopped limply as their props were pushed aside. Then, suddenly, the tank we were trailing disappeared. There was no warning. One second it was pursuing its way, an implacable executioner. The next it had plunged into the weed and was lost to sight. The ends of the grass came together spitefully behind it, weaving themselves together, knitting as we watched an opaque blanket. It closed over and around so that the smooth track ended abruptly, bitten by a wiry green portcullis. I was dismayed, but the captain seemed happy. "'Now we're getting somewhere,' he exclaimed. "'The little devils are eating right into the heart of the old son of a bitch.' We stood there gaping stupidly after our lost champion, but the grass mound was enigmatic and offered us no information as to its progress. A survey of the other tracks showed their tanks, too, had burrowed into the heart of the weed, like so many hounds after a rabbit. "'Well,' said the captain, who by now had apparently accepted me as his confidant, Let's go and see what's coming in over the radio. I was glad to be reminded the tanks weren't lost, even temporarily, and that we would soon learn of their advance. Field headquarters had been set up in a house about two blocks away, and there, after exchanging salutes, passwords, and assorted badinage, the captain led. The men in contact with the tanks, shoulders hunched, fingers rapid with pad and pencil, were sitting in a row by a wall on which had been tacked a large and detailed map of the district. In addition to their earphones, a loudspeaker had also been thoughtfully set up, apparently to take care of any such curious visitors as ourselves. The disadvantage soon manifest was that no plan had been devised to unscramble the reports from the various tanks. As a consequence, whenever two or three came in together, the reports overlapped, resulting in a jumble of unintelligible sounds from the loudspeaker. 
Brr, 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 it was saying as we entered the room. Brr, brr, about three hundred meters, grof, 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 north by northeast. Can you hear me, FHQ? Come in, FHQ. There was a further muddle of words, then. I think my motor's going to conk out. Shall I backtrack, FHQ? Come in, FHQ. Rugged place to stall, commented Captain Eltwis sympathetically. But we can pull them out in half a shake soon as we get things under control. The loudspeaker, after a great deal of gibberish, condescended to clarity again. About five hundred meters, supposed to join SMT-5 at this point. Can't raise them by radio. What do you have on SMT-5, FHQ? Come in, FHQ. I was still speculating as to what had happened to SMT-5 when the loudspeaker once more became intelligible. And the going's getting tougher all the time. I don't believe these goddamn wire cutters are worth a piss in a snow hole. Just fouled up, that's what they are, just fouled up. Got further if they'd been left off. His grumbling was blotted out. For a moment there was complete babble then. If I can guess, it somehow got in the motor and shorted the ignition. I've got to take a chance and get out to look at it. This is SMT-3 reporting to FHQ, now leaving the transmitter. Stalled, so I turned on my lights. Can you hear me, FHQ? Come in, FHQ. Okay, okay, don't get sore. So I turned on my lights. I'm not going to do a bob chat, but I want to tell you it's pretty creepy. I guess this stuff looks pretty and green enough on top, especially in daylight. But from where I am now, it's like an illustration out of Grimm's fairy tales. Something about the place where the wicked ogre lived. Not a bit of green. Not a bit of light, except for my own, which penetrate about two feet ahead and stop. Dead. Yellow and reddish brown stems, thick, interlaced. How the hell I ever got this far, I'd like to know. But not as much as how I'm gonna get out. I'm sticking my head out of the turret now. As far as these stems will let me, which isn't far, they're a solid mass on top of the machine. And beside it. I'm going to take a few tools and make for the engine. Only thing to do. Can't sit here and describe grassroots to you dog robbers all day long. See if I can't get a running and back out. Then I resign from the state of California. Right then. This is SMT-7, leaving the transmitter for essential repairs and signing off. For hours, the reports kept coming in, all in identically the same vein. Rapid progress, followed by a slowdown, then either engine trouble or a failure to keep rendezvous by another tank, all messages concluding alike, now leaving transmitter. It was no use for field headquarters frantically to order them to stay in their tanks, no matter what happened. They were young, able-bodied, impatient men, and when something went wrong, they crawled out to fight their way through a few feet of grass to fix it. After all, they were in the heart of a great city. Their machines had burrowed straightforwardly into the grass, and no threats of court-martial could make them sit and look silly till help arrived and they were tamely rescued. So, one by one, they wormed their way out to fix the ignition, adjust the carburetor, or hack free the cogs which moved the tracks. And one by one, their radios became silent and were not heard again. The captain went from cockiness to doubt, from doubt to anxiety, and then to anguished fury. He had been so completely confident of the maneuver's outcome that its failure drove him not to despair, but to anger. He knew most of the tank drivers personally, and the picture of these friends trapped in their tiny, ever-narrowing pockets of green sent him into a frenzy. SMT-1, that's Lou Brown. Don't get out, Lou! Stay where you are, you jackass! Stay where you are, Lou! he bellowed into the unresponsive loudspeaker. Jake White. Jake White's in four. Said I'd buy him a drink afterwards. Joke. He's a Coca-Cola boy. Why can't you stay inside, Jake? Why can't you stay put? Unable to bear it longer, he rushed from field headquarters shouting, Let's get him out, boys! Let's get him out! and would personally have led a volunteer party charging on foot into the grass if he had not been forcibly restrained and sympathetically led away, sobbing hysterically, toward hospitalization and calming treatment. 
the captain's impulse, though impractical, was shared by all his comrades. For the moment the destruction of the grass became secondary to the rescue of the trapped tank men. If field headquarters had bustled before, it now turned into a veritable beehive, with officers shouting, exhorting, complaining, and men running backwards and forwards as though there were no specific for the situation except unlimited quantities of their own sweat. End of chapter 2, part E